Our classwork, closed classwork this week, has been based on a statement of Paul's. I knew a man who had his being in Christ. The entire theme of the Master's message and mission was, of course, the revelation of heaven on earth, the ability to be that man who had his being in Christ instead of in the earth. The man who has his being on the earth or in the earth is the man who lives by bread alone, who lives by personal effort, who lives by the sweat of his brow, the man who labors physically or mentally, the man who is never quite there, always on the way to achievement or toward achievement, never quite arriving, and should he by chance arrive at the place or goal that he thinks he's looking for, he usually finds there is a horizon. And there is another step to take, another journey to make, and again, never quite arriving. The reason is that the goal that the man of earth is seeking is always out there someplace, just ahead of him, or above him, or beyond him. The goal is always some place or circumstance or condition or even person. But of this we may be sure, that which he is seeking is not within himself. The man, however, who has his being in Christ, is never seeking, never searching, never striving to get anywhere, but always abiding in the realization that he is already there, has already arrived, and is in the kingdom, in that place or state of mind called heaven. The man of earth is always seeking something outside of himself to add to his own pleasure or satisfaction or completion. The man who has his being in Christ, realizing that the whole kingdom of God is within his own being, is at peace and lets his good unfold from within. This man has only to stand and wait. This man is like Burroughs' poem. As the rivers find their way to the sea, so my own shall find their way to me. We need to have no doubts. We need to have no fears, since it doesn't come through some person's goodwill, nor does it come because of some national or international prosperity, nor does it come through favor. It 
comes by grace of God. It comes as the gift of God. And it comes not from far off, but from within, from within one's own being. Watch that as the man of the earth finds his good dependent on something external, he finds his retirement depending on a certain amount of money or income. He finds his vacation dependent upon time or money. He finds his home dependent on uh, price, location. He finds everything necessary and needful to him dependent on something or someone external to his own being, but the man whose being is in Christ does not look outward or upward. He does not think of anything as being dependent upon anything or anyone since, if it is his, it is established within his own being since before Abraham was, and it will be there unto the end of time. Yes, I am come that ye might be fulfilled, and since that I is within our own being, why look outside? to external persons, things, or conditions for that which the eye of me has come to fulfill. And so, safe, secure, in the realization that that eye at the center of my being has come, that I may be fulfilled, that I may enjoy all good, that I may have the abundance of life, the man whose being is in Christ waits patiently, lives patiently, and without one single trace of desire, envy, jealousy, without any need for harmful competition, deceit, treachery, falseness. Why? Why? To gain something he already possesses? No. To gain that which he has more of than anyone else in the world? No, the man who has his being in Christ understands the Master's teaching of love and how it is and why it is it is possible to love. It's a very simple matter to love those who do not take from us, who are not seeking to take from us. And of course there aren't any to the man who has his being in Christ because all that the Father has is mine and he gladly gives it and shares it without any sense of anyone's taking from him or his. In the same way that the Master could never have resented the 4,000, 5,000, or 7,000 that he fed, since he had no feeling that the loaves and fishes belonged to him. Having his being in Christ, he knew the source of the loaves and fishes. And knowing that they weren't his, he could freely share with no sense of resentment, no sense of loss or limitation, no sense that he would be left with less than he had before. The man who has his being in Christ is under divine grace and is never under the law. The man who lives by Moses lives by law. The man who lives by 
Christ lives by grace. How do we interpret that practically? Well, to live according to the law means, of course, to accept that there are external laws like laws of weather, laws of climate, laws of uh, depression or laws of boom, laws of matter, laws of infection, contagion, laws of age, limitation, laws of strength and weakness. Oh, to live under the law puts one under the bondage to every thing or every theory that is advanced into the human world. The law of astrology, the law of inheritance, all these are the laws of Moses, laws of diets, laws of foods, laws of exercise, all of these are the laws that we come under as human beings living under the Mosaic law. And of course, it isn't only the Hebrew race who lives under the laws of Moses. There's the entire world of men and women who live under the laws of humanness or humanity. Only those who have caught the new dimension of life, that is the Christ, are enabled to see that they live and move and have their being in a universe that knows no law. You say four months to the harvest. Oh no, look up. The harvest is in the ground before the seed is planted. That is coming under grace. You say the fishing boats must go out a certain distance and lower their nets. No, stand here on the shore and pray, and the fish will come in and give themselves up. That may sound a little uh, far-fetched, but may I say that that actually is a fact. For years and years and years and more years than you can have any knowledge of, that was how the Hawaiians were fed. They had no boats to go out into deep water for fish, and their priests merely went to the water's edge and prayed. And as they prayed, the fish came in, and all they had to do was stand there and net them or spear them, and their food was provided for them. There's no exaggeration about that. I said this afternoon that headlines would make us think of the tragedy that could occur if there were a nationwide telephone strike. And yet, in all of the South Sea Islands, they have a telephone system without wires, without receivers, and without senders. If you were to land on uh, one tip of an island, within five minutes, the people at the other end of the island would know you had arrived. Why? Because they have the one and only original wireless telegraphy. They contact the source, the one mind, and instantaneously what is known to them is known to the people on the other side of the island. Our own boys in the South Seas met with that in this last war. When they were shocked to find that they made secret landings on islands and within an hour the people on the other end of the island knew all about it. I notice in this uh, Master Christian of Henry Victor Morgan, 
where you are. Mr. Morgan recited the incident of healing and said that when he had occasion for it, he could call upon Mr. Hamblin or Mr. Whitwell of England, even though Dr. Morgan was here in Tacoma, and instantly receive through them the spiritual help necessary for the work he was doing. Well, of course he could. Of course he could. Everyone who rises above metaphysical healing into spiritual healing knows that, knows how it's done, and as a matter of fact, does it. Every day of the week, every week of the year. Why, why should you need your ears to hear what I'm saying if you have a mind that is omnipotent and omnipresent, and you have, God is your mind, why should you be limited then to the knowledge that you can hear or read? Actually, you're not. Actually, you're not. One of the translations of one of the old Greek manuscripts was accomplished by a man who, while he was doing it, was stuck with certain passages that had never been properly translated and uh, who realized that the original writers of these verses must be alive since death is not real, that the mind that produced such work couldn't lapse into unconsciousness or death, and why not go right to the source, the mind of the original author? And he did, and his editors wrote him a letter that never in their history of publishing translations had they found such passages correctly translated and satisfactorily translated. But on reading it, they recognized that for the first time they had read the right translation. Well, there's nothing miraculous about that except the fact that all of the world doesn't know it. That's the only miracle that after thousands of years in which it has been known that God is omnipresent, we still think we are separated from each other. How can we be separated from each other in omnipresence, in the presence of God, which is the presence of the selfhood of each of us? So the man whose being is in Christ is not limited to what he hears or what he sees for his knowledge or even what he reads. But the man who has his being in Christ opens his consciousness and receives divine illumination on any subject, any subject, whether you call it a material one, a cultural one, or a spiritual one, that man receives illumination on any subject where from the infinite nature of his own being. God is his mind. God is his soul. God is his life. And therefore he draws on God, on the withinness of his own being, for infinite demonstration or infinite manifestation. He knows enough not to try to demonstrate a thing, but to demonstrate only his omnipresence in and of God, and then letting that God flow through in any way, in every way, that divine intelligence may direct. The man who's, who has his being in Christ is able to stand this way. naked if necessary, certainly completely devoid 
of what the outer world would call possession, and in the middle of the ocean or the middle of the desert, is enabled to say, I and the Father are one, here and now, this place whereon I stand is holy ground, and therefore all that the Father hath is mine, set me a table right in this wilderness, in the presence of mine enemies, in the presence of lack and limitation, set me a table, and uh, without inquiring as to where the money will come from or how it can happen when there are no supermarkets around, that individual draws from the infinite storehouse of his own being. And then whether it appears as birds coming down and sitting on his head giving themselves up or whether it is fish jumping up out of the water into the boat or flowing into the shore, or whether it is ravens bringing food or a widow sharing the last little drop of oil, it makes no difference how it happens. At meal time, he is fed. His clothes wax not old, and if he hasn't any, some are provided. Out of where? Out of the infinite, invisible, because the man who has his being in Christ is drawing into the visible from the invisible. Sounds kind of impossible until you look out on a barren farm one month and look at the same farm the next month and see that field of growing food or cotton, or whatever it may be, and then realize, why, well, yes, out of this nothingness has come this crop. Out of the invisible has come this visibility. Yes, we had lunch the other day at one of your hotels here, high up in the air that looks out over the city. And I'm sure that the early settlers here who saw this place without a house on it would have been kind of surprised if they had seen what had come into visibility from that same invisible. And you know as well as I do that everything that you see in this city came not out of matter, but out of the mind of man. I would enjoy some materialist saying that that isn't true. I would like some explanation other than this very city in which you find yourself was evolved out of the mind of man. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes. And you say this is a great city to come out of the mind of man. Yes, of course. New York is a great city in London. They come out of the mind of man, but only for one reason. God is the mind of man, and God is unlimited. And we, as the children of God, can draw on that infinite nature and being unto eternity and without limit. Once we have realized that we never draw our good from the visible. Of course, this little thing that I'm telling you now because it is so potent that someday this very thing that I'm telling you will bring to the earth world peace and what I'm telling you now is the only thing there is the only statement there is the only revelation there is that can bring world peace to the earth. Why? There can never be world peace while one man or nation needs something that the other man or nation has. Because never will the nature of man be so unselfish as to say, you take what I've got. No. Only when we rise above the nature of man and learn this, 
that since the kingdom of God is within me, since all of our good is merely the visible coming forth out of the invisible, we no longer need that which the other man has or the other nation has. We can produce our own. Oh, you say, there are certain things we haven't got. No, there are certain things we haven't yet learned how to bring forth from the invisible. It isn't that we haven't got them. We have them. We haven't learned how to bring them forth out of the invisible. A few years ago, the newspapers were full of alarm because there were only so many billion barrels of oil left in the ground. And uh, the nation had been tested from end to end. And there were only so many billion barrels left. And mathematically speaking, the time was arriving when we would be without oil. Well, of course, the very first thing happened to make that foolish was a man invented a new type drill. And instead of this uh, drill bringing up the oil right from the oil well or where that uh, mass of oil was, it whirled around and it brought it in from all four directions from a 360 degree angle or circle. And immediately every well was able to guarantee that it could bring forth four times more than its original capacity. So our billions were multiplied by four. Well, as if that wasn't enough, they made the discovery of this Canadian find, which now all the way, runs all the way right down here to our doorstep in the Northwest. More oil than they can even possible figure a way to use, even if they'll need oil for many more years, which is improbable. Oh no. It isn't a question of saying we can raise wheat and the other fellow can raise oil and let's exchange it. Every nation in the world has everything that it needs. And if what it can't demonstrate at the moment uh, of its own, it can certainly by peaceful means come to agreements on. But don't you see that that never can happen as long as one individual feels himself limited to his own possessions or one nation feels itself limited to its own territory or possessions, only as the world comes to recognize that this is not a finite earth with so many miles of space in it, under it, and above it, but rather comes to the realization that this is a spiritual universe, a universe of mind, of soul, and that we draw forth out of the capacity of that soul which is God. Study the life of the Master and watch how he drew gold out of the fish's mouth, how he multiplied loaves and fishes, how he healed the sick and raised the dead out of what? out of the infinite nature of his godhood. I can of my own self do nothing, but the Father within me is infinite. The Father within me is all power. And Paul recognizes it in the statement, I can do all things through Christ. All things. He didn't seem to recognize any limit there, did he? I can do all things through Christ. Now, at the moment that we make a transition from being a human being who says, I wonder what I can do looking at my purse and counting the money, or I wonder what I can do looking at our jobs and incomes, or I wonder what I can do measuring physical strength or education. The moment he makes the transition from that and says, I live, yet not I. Christ liveth my life, and therefore my life is infinite. And I'll no longer draw on the eye of myself, which can do nothing, but I will begin to draw on the Father within me, 
At that moment of transition, we become that man who has his being in Christ. We are rooted and grounded in the infinite invisible. We have the infinite invisible as our source and for our resource. We draw for ideas from that infinite invisible. We draw our health, our strength. We draw the activity of our muscles and organs and functions of the body. We draw our intelligence. We draw our strength of character and soul. And more than that, strangely enough, if bullets and bombs were flying, we would draw our hiding place, our fortress, out of that same invisible. We wouldn't run around the streets looking for bomb-proof shelves. We would stand wherever we were and realize, having my being in Christ, I am hid with Christ in God, where no form of human belief can reach me or no form of human power. We would quickly realize with Hezekiah, oh, stop worrying. They have only the arm of flesh. We have the Lord God Almighty. Oh, yes, the Hebrew prophets knew it as well as the Christian disciples and master. Every wise man and woman from the beginning of time has known that we do not exist out there in time or space, that we live and move and have our being in God. We live and move and have our being in heaven. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High. How can bombs or depressions reach the secret place of the Most High? Now, is that merely a mythical figure of spirit Speech, or is that a tangible time and place? Everyone sometime must ask themselves the question, is that in a sanctuary? Is that kingdom of God within? Is the secret place of the Most High a figure of speech, or is it an actual place, and can we achieve it? Yes, we can achieve it because we're there. But the demonstration of it lies in our conscious recognition of it. Is uh, this world within me or am I in this world? If I am in this world, then be assured everything external to me can act upon me from a germ to a star. But if this world is embodied within my consciousness, then the first chapter of Genesis becomes true, and I have God-given dominion over the earth, over the waters, over that which is beneath the waters, over that which is in the air, and even that which is in the heavens, which includes the stars of astrology. Now each one must, uh, in truth, certainly in the infinite way, stop being a religionist in the sense of just believing all the wonderful things that are told them about truth and must come down to living religion, living the wisdom of God and accepting as literal truth that there is a secret place of the Most High and I am in it. It is my rock and my fortress, and I'm established on it and established in it, and this very Christ is my protection. And then I do not look outside for protection, but I understand the Master's great wisdom when he said, if you live by the sword, you will die by the sword. If you depend on a person outside, Pretty soon, you'll find a doubting Thomas that'll set you off your beam 
so that you won't even know whether what you know is true, or you'll find a Judas to betray you. If you depend on things in the external, you may be leaning on a broken reed. And sooner or later, the persons and the things that you count on out here fail you. But once, once you no longer depend on a sword or steel plates in a Bible or a bombproof shelter and begin to realize that the word Christ is not a word and it's not a man, it's a state of divine consciousness in which you live, that then, even though it's invisible, becomes your life, your protection, your supply. You use it instead of dollar bills, except that it appears outwardly as dollar bills after you learn to draw on it. You use it instead of bomb-proof shelters, even though it may appear as a bomb-proof shelter. Yes? Christ is not an intangible, it is only an intangible to human sense. It is a tangible, it is more tangible than armies and navies, it is more tangible than bonds and stocks, because it is a substance that doesn't vary in value, it doesn't vary in quality or quantity. There's never any less of it. It's always the same. It's always infinite. And it wouldn't make any difference how greatly you drew upon it. It would still be infinite. And it would still be, what's greater even, omnipresent. Right where you are. Oh, if we could learn one word this week. If we could learn one word and one sentence or one phrase. The one phrase uh, or sentence, I knew a man who had his being in Christ. And then if we could learn one sentence, omnipresent. One se uh, word, omnipresent. Omnipresent. Here is all present. Here is the presence of all. The presence of all life truth, love, the presence of divine wisdom, guidance, direction, protection. Here is the presence of the rock, the presence of the fortress, the presence of salvation. Here is the presence of the health of thy countenance and thy strength. It seems a strange thing to say, uh, God is my strength. Because we go around looking at muscles and looking at the kind of food or exercise that will produce strength, not realizing that God is a tangible. God is, is an actuality. God is a strength. God doesn't produce strength. God doesn't give us strength. God is our strength, the very strength of our muscles. But you can only know that when you are a being or when you are a man who has his being in Christ, when you can say, Ah, oh, I do not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. I do not live by the sword, but by inner salvation. I do not live uh, by thinking, scheming, planning, conniving. I live by the unfolding grace within my own being. I do not live by outer means. I engage in outer means as I'm led from within. But my dependence is on the within. From that moment, we really demonstrate omnipresence. We demonstrate God appearing as form. Prayer appearing as fishes coming on the beach, prayer as birds coming down on our head to be eaten, prayer as being the clothes that wax not old for 40 years. Prayer, that is the word of God, becomes tangible as form. 
A prayer doesn't produce something. A prayer appears as something. The word of God appears as form. That's the secret. Omnipresence. I do not live by bread alone, but by every word. You say, can you eat words? Of course you can. The word that's in your mouth appears outwardly as manna, as food brought by raven, as uh, fruit on the trees or fish in the water. Certainly you can eat words. You say, can I live in a word? Don't I need a roof over my head? Certainly the word appears as a roof. The word doesn't send a roof. No, there's no such thing as a word and a roof. The word is the very substance of that roof, of that house. The word itself is tangible substance. That word does not go forth in vain, does not return void. It does that where unto it is sent. What does it do? It appears outwardly as form. It appears as a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. It appears as the fourth man in the fiery furnace. It appears as a power that shuts the lion's mouth. If you happen to be caught in a cage, as Daniel was, what shuts the lion's mouth? You can't see it, hear it, taste it, touch it, or smell it, but there's something there that shuts his mouth. Certainly there is. The word of God is a strong muscle. A strong hand over any lion's mouth. Of course it is. The word of God in those three Hebrews' consciousness appeared externally as probably asbestos clothing. At least it would seem so to us. Actually, it took the fire out of the flame. You can't believe that that's impossible because probably everyone in this room either has had the experience or knows someone who has had the experience in their own kitchen of being burnt and turning to metaphysical help and in five minutes having all the fire disappear out of the burn and the healing take place quickly. Certainly, it's one of the easiest, if you want to call it that, demonstrations that can be made metaphysically is the treatment of burns and so forth. Everyone in this room has seen poisons made... Uh, uh, impotent, whether it was uh, poison ivy or somebody that accidentally swallowed poison or even took it intentionally. Everyone has seen through truth treatment that which the world calls evil made impotent. Well, that's the word becoming flesh. The word becomes flesh and dwells among us. And so, that man who has his being in Christ lives by, not bread, but by the word of God, and that word becomes flesh and dwells among us. That word becomes our sanctuary. That word of truth, omnipresence. Omnipresence is that word. Omnipresence, or if you like it, omnipotence, omniscience, but omnipresence becomes that thing in which we become so enveloped that nothing that the world calls danger can come nigh thy dwelling place. None of these evils shall befall you. Who you? That dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High, that dwells with this Word of God, who has his being in Christ. Now, the only difference is whether you stand here and say there is a law of fulfillment within me which I call grace or whether you say there's a law outside of me and I don't know whether it's going to act on me for good or evil. The difference is whether you concern yourself with whether person, place, thing, circumstance and condition can take away your freedom of action, freedom of thought, freedom of joy of life, or whether you've come to the realization that I do not live by the consent of persons or conditions 
But I live harmoniously and joyously and abundantly through grace, through the word of God, through omnipresence. Now, that is the nature of our work all of this week in our classwork. And I told you we would have it in our afternoon and our, in our evening work. And we will continue through this week and we will continue through next week to take whatever it is that unfolds out of the high consciousness of a closed class and we'll bring it to those who for one reason or another haven't the opportunity of partaking in that closed class and we'll share it freely with you. Only I ask one thing of you. And don't treat it as if it were a lecture or as if I were just getting a lot of fun out of standing up here and talking about it. The only pleasure I get out of this work is when I see the fruitage of it in your faith, in your body, in your health, in your wealth and, and happiness. And I know that that can't be unless you take it home and make this a part of you. We've been listening to metaphysical lectures for too many years without taking the word of God and making it our own. Now let us please remember that, that even if Jesus Christ were here talking to you, he would have to ultimately say, if I go not away, the comforter will not come to you unless you take heed right now. Don't wait to be fed by the master three times and then find out that you don't know the principle of multiplication. But uh, if you're fed once, if you feel the power of this word once, then take hold and learn the principle of it. It isn't difficult. It uh, does require patience and perseverance. Why? Because it's making a transition from having faith, confidence, and fear of uh, the outer world to an ability to stand still in the face of any outer disaster and say, oh no, I live and have my being in Christ. I am rooted in Christ. I am in the secret place of the Most High where no world belief can touch me or reach me or affect me. As a matter of fact, it is in power. The power of life is not out there. The power of life is within me. And then you see, as you stand with that until you demonstrate a little of it, from there on, it's just unfoldment. The difficult thing is that first bit of proof or demonstration. And uh, the most difficult thing is to give up the idea of demonstrating something for the idea of demonstrating that you are that being in Christ, that you are living by an inner unfoldment and revelation rather than by something in the external world. And now, when you go home tonight, if you have the opportunity, and if not tomorrow morning, read the book of John again, the Gospel of John in your Bible. And pay particular attention when you come to such passages as I have meat, ye know not of, or if you had asked me, I could give you water that would become wellsprings of living water, life eternal, or I am the bread of life, for we do not live by bread alone. For I am the resurrection, for I am the wine, I am the water. And uh, see if you cannot catch this idea tangibly within you that I have been giving you tonight, that you here, just, just right here where you are, you are the embodiment of the whole Godhead. That right where you are is God revealed, manifested, expressed in all of its fullness and all of its glory, that God has given you 
its infinite wisdom, its infinite life, its infinite love, its infinite protection, its infinite canopy of grace, that you are the fulfillment of that and that I, God, am come right where you are as fulfillment and that you do not have to look to man, circumstance, or condition external to yourself, but look to me and be saved. Look to me. Look to the me within you. Look to the me within your own being and try to catch the feeling, why, well, yes, here it is, right here. How could I have been born out into the world and a God off there somewhere? I wouldn't even do that to my stepchildren. God wouldn't do it to his only beloved. No, come. Let's awaken to the fact that here we are thinking that we were alone, unclothed, uncomforted, unfed, and out there was some kind of a God that could feed us and clothe us and protect us. And what's happened that we are not getting all of that good? And the answer will come back to you because you were looking at outside somewhere and I was hiding inside of you all the time. Only you never look there for me. Look to me and be saved. Look to me. Don't look to your bank account. Don't look to your weekly salary. Don't look to your medicine cabinet. Don't look to your food. Look to me and be saved. Look to the infinite invisible of your own being. You be that man who had his being in Christ whose whole hope was not in person, place, or thing, but in the spiritual life within your own being. And understand that when the Master says, I am the bread of life, that bread is within you. I am the wine, I am the water, I am the resurrection, that I is within you. That I has come within you that you might be fulfilled. Look unto me and be saved. But remember, you're violating Christ when you look outside of yourself for safety or security or for peace of mind or peace of soul or peace of bread. You are violating Christ when you take up the sword in defense. Anytime you think you have to defend yourself, whether it's from outer enemies or slander or gossip. Anytime you feel you have to defend yourself or your good name, you are dishonoring God. You don't have to defend yourself. Not from bullets or bombs. You don't have to defend yourself from slander or gossip. You don't have to defend yourself from competitors. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. Let God take care of it. God has a way of being our sure defense. Yes, but not with that personal eye is in there trying to help God. Oh no, God is my sure defense. Out there, oh yes, they have the arm of flesh. You know what happens to it? The moment they start to use it, they start fighting among themselves. The first thing you know, they're killing themselves off and here we are. That's what happened in Hezekiah's day and in the days of many others. You'd be surprised what happens when you lay down your defense, mental or physical. The moment you completely relax and say, no more do I fight the battles of this world. No more do I try to save this world. No, no. Omnipresence is the power. All I have to do is close my eyes, open my consciousness, and it floods in there. It floods in there from God. And it may be God as impersonal being, or it may be God appearing as Jesus Christ or Moses. It may be God appearing as some uh, saint, sage, or seer. It may be God appearing as some day, but it'll be God. It'll be the word of truth appearing as flesh, as demonstration, if you close your eyes and open your consciousness. After a while, you can open your consciousness without closing your eyes. 
Life only becomes beautiful when the struggle is over. Out in the world, they would say, yes, in the age of retirement, when you don't have to struggle for a living. But by that time, usually, we're so physically ill that uh, even the abundance of money doesn't make up for the age that's come with it. Now, that's not the time of peace. Take my word for it. The time of peace is not after you've accumulated enough money. It is after you have accumulated enough Christ consciousness. From then on, peace is very, very omnipresent, always with you. And you understand again what the Master means when he says, Before Abraham was, I was with you, and you never have to worry. And I will be with you until the end of the world, and you'll never again have to worry. And then you learn how foolish it was. All of the swords that we've taken up in defense of ourselves, mental swords and physical swords. All of the armor we've protected ourselves with except the armor of spirit, the armor of this truth. And yet that was the only armor that was ever necessary. There'll never be a steel shortage for us because we won't need what it makes. I knew a man who had his being in Christ, and I can assure you he had no earthly troubles. Thank you.